Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship. We are so glad and excited that you're here this morning. Uh, this is a, a special day, and I want you to welcome Michael Phillips, our, our First Baptist welcome. He's a member of our family, of course, and actually grew up in this church uh, quite a bit, and uh, this is a special day for him, and you'll hear more about this later, but we're going to have the honor of voting to uh, license him in, into the ministry, so that's a very exciting thing for him, and you're going to hear more about that. Uh, but that's, uh, that's an exciting thing that will happen today. So you be in prayer for him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, as we prepare our hearts now to, to worship. Father God, thank you for this day, Lord, and, and thank you for the body of Christ. Lord, I, I just thank you so much that, uh, that we've been able to see Michael grow up in you and in your word as he has uh, been a part of this family for, for many years now. And God, we continue to, to pray for him as he steps out into a new adventure, Lord. So Today is a day of celebration. Today is a day for us to be thankful, God, for who you are and thankful for your son, Jesus. And Father, if there's some places in our lives, Lord, just because of, of all kinds of things that have, that have happened to us or that are going on right now in our lives, um, if there's some of those places where we need to give them over to you and trust in you completely, Father, help us to do that today. Help us to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. One. Two, three, four. Amen. Let's stand and sing to the sweet trust in Jesus. Save the Lord Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come before you today and we thank you that we can trust you. We can trust you more and more each day. And we love you and we thank you that we can gather in this place, we can gather online and proclaim our praises to you. Father, today is your day and we gather in your house to worship you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Great to see you in the house of the Lord today. Welcome those watching us online. We gather here today to worship our Lord and Savior. Uh, if you are a guest with us in person, I want to draw your attention to the yellow card just there in the back of the pew in front of you. If you wouldn't mind, grab that yellow card, complete it. And then at the end of the service, on your way out, whether you head out that direction or you head out towards our east parking lot, uh, there's a place that you can drop that yellow card. Uh, if you are a guest, first-time guest, I encourage you to take that yellow card to the table that's out here in this foyer. Uh, we'll have uh, some people meet you there and greet you, and they have a small gift for you as well. On the back of that yellow card is a place for prayer concerns and praises, and we as a church family would love to partner with you in whatever's going on in your life. And so uh, if you've got a prayer or a praise, feel free again to use that yellow card and place that either in the box that's in that foyer or the box by the church office on your way out. Well, this is a wonderful day of worship, and we are glad uh, that you're here. Several things that are going on, not only as we are praising our Lord and Savior, but today also we've got our guest music leader uh, in Michael Phillips. And uh, Michael called, I don't know, it's been a little over a month now, and uh, Michael's been serving. Where have you been serving? His I've been music serving leader? at Christway Baptist Church outside of Springtown. And you were there for how long? I was there for a year and a half. For a year and a half, and during one of our summers, uh, last summer, I think, you, is that right? Two or you summers were, ago, 2019. Time flies when you're having fun, <laughs> was, uh, my, was there Mel's intern, and uh, you spent a lot of time also with our church. Your family, I think, is back there in the back. There's the Philip family, Philip clan, and uh, God's definitely done some great things in your life. And, and you called me and said, hey, what would it take to be licensed into vocational ministry? And so we started that process there, and it's led us to today. And so would you now just share with the church family, part of the process of licensing a person into vocational ministry is, is allowing them to share their testimony, what God has done in their lives, as well as how they've heard God's call upon their lives. I truly believe all of us as believers in Christ are called to follow after him. We're called to serve him in some way or another. God's gifted us and talented it is to do that. Uh, some, God has called into specific ministry, specific leadership uh, moments. And others, God has called them to go and to make a career out of following God and serving him in the form of ministry. And I believe that's where Michael is today. And so uh, part of the licensing process is for him to share his testimony with the church family. You are his church family. And then at the end of the service, we will enter into a special call business meeting and ask all of our church members at that time, if you feel led to uh, vote him uh, to be licensed, if you agree with that, you after hearing his call, his message, um, his uh, testimony today, uh, and I think you as well will hear and see uh, that God has placed his hand upon Michael's life and his calling. And so at that point, we will vote. And then following the vote, as Bill and his team quickly adds those all up, uh, if the affirmative is there, then uh, we will officially license you in the ministry. But right now, would you tell us your story? Tell us what God's been doing in your life. Yes, absolutely. So I grew up in church with my very loving family over there um, who taught me from an early stage to trust and believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I was uh, baptized around the age of eight or nine, um, and God has really taken off from there. And so my calling to ministry, I believe, started in junior high, even though I didn't realize it at the time. Um, just time after time, I was given many opportunities, many gifts, many blessings, um, and many chances to serve in the music ministry, specifically here at First Baptist Church. And Nathan was involved with that, and Mel, and Caleb, I don't know where he is right now, and Ann, Caleb's up in the top. Okay. Um, but uh, time after time, getting to serve with our youth ministry in music and getting to serve up here with Mel and his team. Um, and then all really leading up to the internship in the summer of 2019 with Mel. And that was really just a great time for me to learn and to grow. And... When I got done with that, I really felt like God had solidified the call for me to ministry. 
and specifically music ministry. And it actually wasn't long after that, um, Mel had given me several opportunities during the summer to lead worship with you all here. And then maybe two months afterwards, um, I was really feeling like I needed to be back leading worship. Um, and so I applied to a church, and I never actually heard back from that first church. But then, um, as I was starting to feel this pull to be back up and leading um, in musical worship, um, then I actually got a surprise chance to lead a single song in a service, <laughs> which really confirmed for me that calling. And so at that point, then I was no longer um, willing to accept not doing the full potential that God has called me to. And so I, I found another church to apply to, and within a few hours, <laughs> I, sent, I emailed them in the evening of a Saturday morning, and on that Sunday morning, the pastor emailed me back, said, come on, come on down. Um, and many of y'all were here during that transition, which happened so fast. Um, and so Christ Way was such a blessing to me. I got to learn and to grow and to pour into them as they poured back into me. And so now I'm getting ready to, um, after I graduate from my undergrad this December, I'm planning on starting at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary to get my master's in worship leadership mm -hmm. to then be able to continue to grow and to pursue that calling that God has for me. Amen. Well, Michael, we are very proud of you, and we're very proud of the way God's been working in your life, and you've been allowing him to mold you and shape you. And so we're very proud to be able to partner with you in ministry. And so we as a church get to do that here in just a few more moments and, uh, and to consider that. And now, uh, just because I think it's an interesting uh, situation, you're spending your last six months of your undergraduate doing what? So I'm actually leaving this Friday. I'm going to leave early in the morning. I'm going to drive for two days to Los Angeles, California. I've got an internship that I'm going to be going to um, where I'll be serving in the music therapy department of a senior living center down there where I will have a chance to get to pour into these lives and then to be able to gain more music skills, even though music therapy, I don't believe, is the call, the permanent call that God has for me. And uh, because the housing is so available in uh, Los Angeles <laughs> County, uh, you found where to stay? So I'm going to be living in a yurt. A yurt, if you don't know, is like a big Mongolian hut. <laughs> it's just a big round room. There's, but it's fully furnished. It's got electricity. Um, <laughs> um, and I was actually even telling Mel just this past Thursday, I found out that there's going to be an organ in the yurt, which is, so I'll, get to, I'll get to work on those organ skills. Too. <laughs> well, very good. Well, let's, let's take a moment. Let's pray for Michael. So, Father, we come before you today. We thank you for Michael. We thank you, God, for his call that you've placed upon his life. And the God, the way that you've used multiple people, Father, from his family and Father, from uh, Mel and, and Caleb and Ann and, and uh, other youth leaders and college leaders and churches. And, and God, it truly does take a village. And Father, we thank you that, uh, God, your people, uh, God, work to help and serve and use their gifts and talents to help others, God, follow their calling that you placed upon them. And so we pray for Michael. Pray for today, God, it just be a special day in his life. Father, he'll again look back to today and years down the road and God know and, and have a, a place and say, you know, God, I know it's tough today, but I know you called me to serve you. And so, God, I will faithfully continue to do that. And Father, I pray your blessings upon him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Let's stand as we sing. Do it again.
and thank you so much. You can be seated for just a minute. Uh, this really is such a thrill to be a part of this service uh, and to have Michael leading us this morning. And we just want to uh, take a moment to remind you about our, our offering. Uh, it's not taken up in the normal way, but it, uh, it is your opportunity to, opportunity to give and to be a part of God's kingdom and what he's doing in this place. So if you do have an offering to, to give today, there's a place in the foyer a box, and there's a box down by the office. There's also, if you're worshiping online with us, there's a link to go and uh, to, to give there. So as we continue to worship, let's pray together. Father God, again, we are thankful, so, so thankful uh, for Michael and uh, for his leadership and for his, your, your call, Lord, upon his life. And so we continue, God, just to to lift him to you, to pray for protection and blessing, God, as he uh, moves forward and, and, and answers your call, God. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, those that are giving today. We pray that uh, it would forward your kingdom, Lord, and uh, help us now to continue to worship you and trust in you. And uh, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We both got it. Thank you. 
here, Lord, you are the only one who can do all those things. We turn our mourning into dancing in times of celebration. Lord, you bring the dead to life. You part the sea so that we can walk with you. And you're the only one who can do all these things. And so we give praise to you and we put our trust in you today because we know that your promises stand faithful and secure. Lord, we have a hope, as Hebrews says, an anchor for our soul. Lord, because we know that you are all-powerful and you are almighty. Lord, be with us today as we study your word, as we learn more about you, and as we meditate on your truths. God, we're so grateful for all that you've done. God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the sacrifice, Jesus, that you made for us. May the Holy Spirit dwell in us so that we may be revealed or that your truth may be revealed to us. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, we're in Hebrews. We're going to be actually looking at a couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 for just a moment, and then we'll go back to chapter 8 and finish up from last week. We're finishing up a series on covenants, and uh, today is part two of a two-part message on a new covenant. And uh, as we've been talking about Covenants. Covenants is a way that God uh, uses to establish relationships, an outline of relationships uh, with his creation, with people. Uh, we looked at last week how God used those covenants from the very beginning. Do you all remember who was the very first covenant made with? Adam and Eve. Close. Abraham as well. But Adam and Eve, very first two people. On the planet, God made a covenant, and he continued on making covenants. He made them with Noah, with Abraham, there you go, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and Israel uh, as a people, uh, also a Davidic covenant, covenant with King David. And uh, the people of Israel showed that they could what? Could they keep the covenant? No, they couldn't keep the agreements with God, and because of it, they faced severe consequences. The Apostle Paul summed up all those consequences, I think, in the first part of Romans 6, 23, where he says, for the wages of sin is death. And so over and over again, uh, the Israelites, they uh, had this covenant, this relationship. And I define covenant, if you'll go ahead and go to that uh, screen, if you will. The covenant basically is a binding agreement between two parties containing one or more promises. And so it's not necessarily a contract, it's not a contract at all, it's a covenant. And scripturally speaking, when you look at covenants, you see that when people broke covenants, uh, there were severe consequences, even to the point of death. And so uh, that was the focus here, as we're talking about through covenants. God loved the world, though. Even though Israelites kept breaking the covenants, and even though they kept messing up on their agreements, God loved his people. He loved them tremendously. And from the very beginning, he had a plan to help to reconcile people with God, to help bring them out of that lifestyle of sin from that very beginning. And he desired no one to perish. And so part of his plan, God provided a new covenant, a new covenant made with the Israelites, new and better covenant with better promises. And as a result of this new covenant, all the nations would be blessed. All of them, not just the Israelites, not just the Hebrew nation, not just those uh, nation that God took out of Egypt and brought across uh, the wilderness into the promised land, but all the nations would be blessed. In Genesis 22, verse 18, God speaking to Abraham says, in your seed, 
all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed me. Through Jesus, Abraham's seed, through Jesus, the old covenant was made obsolete and the nations were blessed. So let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 10. We'll look at two verses here. Here is speaking of Jesus, the author of Hebrews is writing. He's writing to a, a Hebrew uh, Christian group uh, who are struggling with this idea of going back to the old ways of life, going back to this old lifestyle of all the things that was coming about from the Jewish standpoint. And so they were struggling with, with this idea. They come to know Christ, they've trusted in Christ, but yet all the things of their old way was coming back kind of to haunt them. And so they were being uh, pulled in that direction. And here's what he says to them. And would you please stand in honor of reading God's word? Uh, and we're going to start in the middle of verse 9, uh, where it says this of chapter 10 of Hebrews. He says, he, speaking of Jesus, takes away the first, speaking of the covenant, the old covenant, in order to establish the second, or the new covenant. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you today, and we thank you, God, that you desire to have a relationship with all of us. You desire to have a relationship with your greatest creation, those created in your image. You love us. And Father, you wouldn't let sin stop that relationship. And so you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross so that we could have forgiveness of sin, so that we could have that right relationship with you. We thank you, God, for that sacrifice. We thank you, God, for your love for us. And Father, we pray that as we, God, study your word today, that you'll speak to us. And you'll help us, Father, not to go back to those old ways of our lives, the ways before we met you. Help us to step out in faith each and every day, to trust you, to walk with you, to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Trying to understand this concept of an old covenant and a new covenant, it's been kind of uh, challenging, fun to work with, if, if I must ad admit. And, and uh, I ran across this one illustration this past week of how one pastor explains that, and, and he explained it by, by looking at an idea of a typewriter. Uh, how many of you still have a typewriter at home? Anybody? All right, when's the last time you used your typewriter? This week? Last week? Two weeks ago? A month ago? No, a year ago? I got no hands. Anybody online? No. You know, it's been a while. You know, use a typewriter. But how many 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago now, you use a typewriter on a regular basis? Yeah, look around. You know, we, we use a typewriter and we appreciate that, especially if you've seen my handwriting, right? You know, you'd want me to type up a letter, a memo to you. Okay, uh, I think I got a picture of an old manual typewriter. And so when you think about typewriters and, and you think about those, uh, they served a purpose, right? They, they were used uh, for a purpose. We, we, we use typewriters to, to type up papers. I, 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 thankfully, I, had to, I was young enough at the time and moving through that, that the word processing system started coming in. So uh, I, I wouldn't have to back up and take white out and change my typewriting thing. I could use a computer and I can move forward with that. Well, this one pastor said this. He says, uh, he talked about this. And he says, the technology and idea of a typewriter was eventually developed into an electronic faster and far more complex computer that does word processing. But when typing on a computer, we realize that we still are using the old manual typewriter's technology. They didn't change the keyboard, right? Pat, didn't you teach uh, typing all the way through school? And that's the same kind of keyboard, if you will, maybe not as the, the, the depression and all the different things are a little bit different, but the layout very similar to what we learned when we did, uh, when we learned how to type on a typewriter. And this, this author goes, he says, further, we realize that the computer far transcends the typewriter um, and typewriter's technology. Uh, if, if, it, it transcends the typewriter. Everything that a typewriter wanted to be when it was a little boy and more 
is found in the computer, right? Uh, this compares to the law. Everything the law wanted to be, talking about the old covenant, everything the law wanted to be when it was young, as revealed to Moses there on Mount Sinai and to the people of Israel, is found now in Christ and in the life of the Spirit. Thus, when a Christian lives in the Spirit and under Christ, that Christian is not living contrary to the law, but is living in transcendence of the law, he says. The word big transcendence means this. It means has risen above the old covenant to a superior state. From a life lived under judgment to now a life lived under grace. How many of you would rather, rather live a life under grace than a life under judgment? Right? We want that. We, that. And we have that in Christ Jesus. We have a life lived under grace. I love it. I love this thought and idea of computer versus a keyboard. You can go back, if you would, Samuel, to that uh, picture there. of Just the difference there between uh, manual typewriter and now our new technological computer. Uh, when a computer age arrived, we put away our manual typewriters because they belong to a former era. The Hebrews author critique of this Judaizers, those who said, you as a, as a Christian who, who came out of the Jewish religion, you have to follow all the Jewish stuff as well as following Christ. And, and the author of Hebrews, you know, critiqued them and said that that was not true. They did not need to happen in that way. He calls them to put, a ma put the manual typewriters away. But in putting them away, we don't destroy them. We fulfill them by typing on the computers. Now that Christ has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law, but not because the law is contrary to the promise, rather it's because the law fulfilled in Christ and the Spirit in a manner similar to the way that a typewriter is fulfilled in the technology of a computer. The old covenant, the new covenant, a typewriter and a computer. The bottom line is this, the scripture is clear, Jesus by his death made obsolete the Mosaic Covenant, and he established a new and everlasting covenant that blesses and unites all who trust in him. So go back to Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to continue on there, starting in verse 7, and uh, look at this passage. Hebrews chapter 8 really kind of, kind of brings together this idea of this old covenant becoming obsolete and the new covenant provided by Christ. And uh, we see here in this that uh, the author of Hebrews begins quoting a long quotation from uh, the book of Jeremiah. And, and we see that starting there in verse 8. We see that from the beginning uh, of this Jeremiah quote that it's God who does the work. Please note that there in verse 8. For finding fault with them, he says, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect, I will establish, I will create a new covenant. It is God who does the work. Amen? I mean, it's God who does it. God works in our lives. He works in this church. He works in our community. He works among things, bringing about his purposes. Uh, he, he brings about things in our lives for our good. It's God who does the work. God created the heavens and the earth. He created you and me. He created all these living things on this earth. He does this work for his glory and for his honor and because he loves you and me. And this new covenant is brought about because of God. Now, God found fault, verse 8 says. He says, he, for finding fault with them, he then establishes this new covenant. What did he find fault with? Not with the covenant, not with the old covenant, but he found fault with the people who the old covenant was with. If you keep reading on, you see, when the house of Israel uh, and with the house of Judah, this is who he's going to establish this new covenant with. It's those people who he actually found fault with because they were the ones who he had the old covenants with who they f did not fulfill their agreements. And so it was with them that he found fault, uh, and he then therefore established the new covenant. As verse 9 reminds us, the ancestors of these current Israelites were the ones, again, who did not continue in God's covenant. They were the ones that over and over again failed to meet their end of the agreement. And because they did not keep the covenant, the Lord said, look in my verse, this is New American Standard. He says it this way there at the end of verse 9, I did not care for them. Now, 
New American Standard, I love the Bible. It, it's a great Bible. It's a very literal Bible. And so it tries to take the, the language that was written in, in Hebrew here in the Old Testament specifically, and literally write word for word kind of out. It doesn't always come across uh, as well as we'd like to hear it. But it says in this idea, I think, is this, is he brings judgment upon them. What we talked about last week in Deuteronomy 28, there is conditions. If you follow the commands, blessings were yours. If you do not follow the commands, what came? Curses, judgment came upon you. And so he turned away from them. And the biggest judgment of all is having God turn away from you, having God move away from you. Uh, they were in the wilderness. You remember the story of Moses? They were in the wilderness, and Moses is up on the mountain, and, and he's having a wonderful time with God. And, and the people down below, they've been sitting there for a while. They don't know what's happened to Moses. They call Aaron, the priest, Moses' brother, and says, hey, create for us a golden calf. And, and he does. And, and, and God comes across them and comes before them and, and realizes what's happening. He knows, of course, all that's going on. Moses comes down from the mountain, smashes the Ten Commandment tablets and, and all the things that are going on. Well, Moses and God start having this conversation and God says, you know what, I'll just destroy them all and, and, and just make a new nation out of you. And Moses prays and says, no, God, let's don't do that. And then God says later on, of course, well, then, okay, what, I'll give you the promised land, but I won't go with you. And Moses says, it's not the promised land unless you're there with us. And that's, I think, uh, what's truly so amazing about our God is that he does care for us, and he wants a relationship with us, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to bring us back in that relationship so that we can be with him. In fact, he says later on in this passage, if you go on there to ver into verse 10, he does all this, and we're going to talk more about what happens in verse 10 in just a moment, but he says, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's our God who loves us and wants a relationship with us. You know, there are... Uh, some amazing things that God is doing. And, and the old covenant was very legalistic. And there was no way, though, that any one of the Israelites could keep it perfectly. The old covenant was difficult to follow. And it was very difficult to follow, mainly because it was externally uh, managed. It had to be something on the outside to take care of. You know, it had to be on the outside to take care of the things that was called for for the Old Covenant. Think about that for a moment. Under the Old Covenant, under the law, obedience was mostly out of fear of punishment. All right? You do this or don't do this, and if you don't do this, then this is what's going to happen to you. It, it was motivated by fear, and, and fear can motivate us, right? We, we've all experienced that, right? Uh, my household has experienced that. If you don't do what I'm going to say, you're going to get a spanking. That's fear, right? And, and so there is some motivation that comes along that that, that, that happens. But fear, I don't think, is one of the greatest motivators, and God knows that. And so, but it was on the exterior. It was on the outside. It was also supposed to be written on stone tablets. We know that originally. It was written on stone tablets. Uh, the Israelites as well were to write the Shema or write the command of God uh, also upon uh, the doorposts of their house. They were supposed to also write it on their hands and on their heads. And so uh, it was these external things that were going to happen, all external. It was all about the things that person had to do. That was the old covenant. However, the new covenant puts God's laws, commands into their minds and into their hearts. Look again at verse 10. It says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. He moves it from the outside to the inside. And a greater motivator is love. A greater motivator is when it's something that, that comes from all that we are, the passion of our lives. And so he moves it from the outside to the inside. And under the new covenant, obedience to God is done out of love and thanksgiving instead of fear. The motivation for obeying God moved from the external to the internal. Uh, I was reading some uh, other things this past week, and, and I ran across... Uh, uh, a, a technology that came out about five years ago. I think there's a picture, Samuel, of this uh, car. Uh, Ford uh, developed a car back in 2015. Maybe you've heard of this. Maybe you even have this on your car. I don't have it on my car. It might save me uh, from getting tickets. But, but there's a speed uh, limiter uh, type deal. And this, uh, back in 2015, Ford developed uh, a car that can actually read the speed limit signs and slow down by itself. 
Ford's uh, S-Max was called, mostly in Europe, uh, developed this technology that crossed over to other manufacturers. The intelligent speed limiter technology scans traffic signs and adjusts the throttle to help keep drivers within legal speed limits and avoid fines. How many say you wish you had that when you were a teenager, right? <laughs> Just to avoid the fines. <laughs> okay, well, uh, here's some more things that, about this, this deal. The system does not apply the brakes when the sense is a lower speed limit, but it controls the engine torque by electronically adjusting the amount of fuel delivered. Now, there's torque and there's horsepower. Some of you guys know the difference between that. Uh, and, and so I don't know the much of the difference between that. But what I do understand is that the torque is actually kind of the power, if that's right, that kind of helps to, to move uh, the vehicle. And the bigger the cars, the more torque it needs to, to get going and to get moving, to get turning. And so uh, that torque there was then internally adjusted by the computers. It reads the sign, I'm going 60, I need to be going 50, there's a cop on the other side, I better slow down, right? And so it internally makes the adjustments inside the engine to reduce the speed of your car. Now, Humans, especially Americans, don't like to be told what to do, don't like to have computers tell them what to do. So there is a way out of that. If you don't want that to happen, you just press on the gas. <laughs> and according to Ford, it just continues on and keeps moving forward at the, temp at the speed that you want it to be. You know, Ford has developed a helper of sorts, if you will, in the speed limiter. And so it's a helper that to help people follow the law of the road. They've moved this from an external source, the driver, right, to an internal source, the speed limiter technology. You know, we have an internal source as well. It's the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit who, who can do kind of the same thing for us. The Holy Spirit, as John 14, 26 tells us, teaches us all things and brings to our remembrance all that Jesus said. In John 6, 8, we also see that the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so we have this internal limiter as well. And that's what writes on our hearts, and that's what places things in our mind. It's God through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does amazing work in each and every one of our lives. And when it's coming from the inside, we have a, an opportunity to either listen or not listen. Just like that speed limiter on that Ford vehicle, we can decide to not listen to the Holy Spirit. We can decide to press on that gas and to keep moving forward. Have you ever had the Holy Spirit? You don't have to raise your hand on this, but have you ever had the Holy Spirit? Think about this. Uh, you were heading something, doing something, maybe about to watch something, maybe about something to come out of your mouth, maybe some interaction you're about to have, and, and, and the Holy Spirit kind of said, no, 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 you need to think about this. Hey, you might want to realize, what does my word say? How are you to treat one another? And you just press on that gas anyway, and you go right through it. And then on the other side of that, you go, God, I should have listened to you. The Holy Spirit is there inside of us, helping us, walking with us through that. And it's there guiding us and directing us. And as I think here, as the author of Hebrews, also quoting from Jeremiah speaking, is that God is wanting to allow the God through the Holy Spirit to help us be all that we can be. There's some great things that the Holy Spirit provides. Uh, when we listen to the Holy Spirit, we get to experience so many things. It's not there to limit us, but it's there to free us, to unburden us, to allow us to experience wonderful blessings. Some of these blessings are called the fruit of the Spirit. We see that in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, where it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know, the new covenant is eternal, internal, and don't miss this. It's actually accomplished by the Trinity, by the triune God. God established it. He accomplished it. Jesus shed his blood for it, and the Holy Spirit works it out in our lives. Truly amazing. You know, all this new covenant is made available by God's mercy and forgiveness. Hebrews 8.12 says this there. says, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. That's what this new covenant's about. It's about God's mercy. It's about his forgiveness. Leon Morris in his commentary said, the new covenant is not based on some commitment on the part of the people to be perfect in their obedience to the commands of God. It's based on forgiveness. The cross is at the heart of the Christian way, and the cross speaks of the love that brought forgiveness. When Christians sin, 
There is no need for a fresh sacrifice. The one sacrifice once offered keeps the new covenant in force. It puts the sin away, and God remembers sin no more. For a time, the old covenants fulfilled a purpose, but now it's time to move on and never turn back. For those who were first reading the, the book of Hebrews, probably didn't realize just how much the old covenant was fading away. The book was probably written a few years before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, from the destruction of the altar. And with no priest and no altar, there would be no old covenant. It was truly finished. And when Jesus gave up his life and died for our sins, the age of the old covenant was over. And the new age of God's Son came into being forever. You know, scholars differ on whether the new covenant was ever made uh, with the Gentiles. The prophecy of Jeremiah had a focus towards, as you read through it, the Israel and Judah. That was their focus. They were the ones who broke the old covenant. They were the ones to receive the new covenant. That was the focus of the prophet Jeremiah. That's the focus here of, of the author of Hebrews. The old covenants were made with them directly. But ultimately, one is not saved through a covenant. As Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You know, this new covenant was going to be a life-changing uh, adventure for them. But it's not the covenant that saved them. It was Christ who died on the cross. For their sins and all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life salvation comes through faith in christ not faith in a covenant romans 10 9 and 10 says it this way if you confess with your mouth jesus as lord and believe in your heart god raised him from the dead you will be saved for with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation god promises that all who do this all who calls upon the name of the lord will be saved this is an agreement between God and all the people of the world based on a promise, no matter one's race. Whether you believe or not that the Gentiles can be in this new covenant with God, I think we should all be able to say that the promises of the new covenant are indeed for all. The promises of the new covenant are indeed for all. Paul describes this, and I won't take a long time, but if you would just flip over to Ephesians chapter 2. And I encourage you to read this on your own, specifically starting in verse 11. But let me highlight just a few things here. And here is Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus and talking about these Gentiles. Hell, now the focus is the Gentiles, those who are non-Israelites. Uh, and he says to them, there starting in verse 11, he says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Before Christ, you Gentiles, that's me, I'm a Gentile, were without hope. But notice what it says next, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, because of what Jesus did on the cross, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our uh, peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And you can go on and read and say in verse 19, I love verse 19, it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. And if you were to keep reading on and keep going all the way into chapter 3, look at verse 6. It says this, To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We as Gentiles, we who are not part of those original chosen people of God, those who God had those old covenants with, we have the opportunity to partake in all the promises of God, specifically the promises here given through the new covenant of a salvation in Christ Jesus. 
This new group, this one people made into one, today is called the church. The church. If you were to keep reading again through Ephesians 4, we would see that God lays out for the church the unity of the Spirit of a way that Christians should w- live and work with one another and, re- and, and interact with one another. Just for instance, it says, if you were to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were called, says in verse 1, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. And then in verse 6, it talks at verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Covenants are a way of forming some agreements with promises between two parties. God made those covenants with the Old Testament. He made the covenant, a new covenant, with those who had broken the old covenant. And then he allows all of us who know him and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior to experience all the promises given to God, given from God to the people of Israel through that new covenant. The church, that is us. And God desires a relationship with each and one of us, and he desires us to have a relationship with each and every one of us, both vertical relationships and horizontal relationships. Now, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but our church actually has a church covenant. It's not written here in the Bible, but the the truth of the covenant, much of that, comes from God's words. We have a church covenant agreement made between each other for the purpose of fulfilling God's mission for us as a church. The covenant that we have currently is found in our church's constitution and bylaws. And I know every one of you has a constitution and bylaws on your table at home and you read it every day. No, Phil does. <laughs> Chairman of our constitution and bylaws committee. No. You know, it, probably two years ago, I was working on a membership series, uh, what it means to be a member of our church. And, and I found that covenant within our constitution and bylaws. I knew it had been there, but I never really spent a lot of time looking over it. And, and, and I did years before because I pulled things out of that to talk to our new members about, about what it means to be a member. And, and I listed some things about our covenant in our new membership class about expectations and uh, also benefits of what it means to be a member. And in 2019, I, I, I preached through a series, probably about 12 or so different messages about the expectations of church members and the, and the benefits that comes. And I think I've got some slides. I won't go through all of those. It might be kind of small to read, but basically here's, here's what it says. It says, for expectations of members is be faithful to all the duties essential to the Christian life. Call yourself a Christian, act like it. It's really what it means. Attend the church services of the church. Show up. If you're a member, be a part. Join in. And I would say be a part of a small group as well. Give regularly for its support. Sustain the pastor and other leaders in prayer. Share in the organized work of the church. And finally, strive for health and growth of the whole body through practice of Christian love. Those are the expectations for church members. Benefits, there's great benefits that comes as well. Church membership helps to identify a person as a true believer. It provides a spiritual family who is there to support and encourage your walk with Christ. It gives you an opportunity to use your gifts and talents for God's kingdom. It places you under spiritual protection of godly leaders. And the church, as a church member, gives you the accountability you need to grow. There's some great benefits that also comes. From that. But as the Constitution and Bylaws Committee was looking at the covenant that's in our Constitution, uh, we noticed that there are probably some things that might need to be rewritten, might need to be changed. You know, the, the covenant that we use have been used by Baptist churches for over a hundred years. In fact, some of the covenant came back, originally written back in 1850. And so you can imagine uh, how our language has changed since 1850, and you can imagine how things in life has changed and how understanding uh, from one person to another has changed. And so uh, the Constitution and Bylaws Committee thought it would be worth us as a church to kind of take a look at our church covenant. Uh, to, and so for the last three, four weeks, counting today, our Sunday school classes have been going through some lessons that we've been preaching through uh, what it means, uh, specifically the biblical covenants, and uh, would love to have more conversations about our church covenant and what that might look like down the road. Maybe we review it. Maybe we change some things. on it. Maybe we leave it alone. That's, of course, up to you as the church. And so um, 
Phil will be out in the back. If you go, well, what? I've never read our church covenant. He's got some copies, I believe. And if you would like one, you can grab one, or you can kind of hang out and wait until the Constitution and Bylaws Committee brings some things back to us as a church. Well, the bottom line is this, is that covenants were developed to help us be in relationship, first with God and with one another. You know, Jesus, by his death, made obsolete the Mosaic Covenant, the covenants of the Old Testament. He opened up uh, the covenant relationship with all who trust in him. And as awesome as this is, however, there is still a problem. Christians today, like the Hebrews, have a tendency to be pulled back into their old way of living before Christ. We might not turn back to the Jewish Levitical system of yearly sacrifices, right? And all the other Jewish laws from the Old Testament, but we can fall back into the same old life of our selfish endeavors. When we encountered Christ, Christ changed our lives. But there's still a world that we live in. And that world, many times, still tries to pull us back in to that old way of living before Christ. We have a choice. We have a choice, just like that speed limiter technology in that Ford. When God speaks to our hearts through the Holy Spirit, we have a choice to listen or not, to press on the gas and to go straight through or to say, wait a minute, God, what are you trying to tell me? You know, like the speed limiter technology has an override, we can override the Spirit's control in our lives too. You know, it's easy for me to not limit things in my life or not exclude certain things from my old life at times. For some people, these old sinful ways have a way of building strongholds in their lives. You know, these strongholds are things uh, uh, in our lives, sins in our lives that have been part of our lives for a long time. And, and when we came to know Christ, we, we kind of dealt with it a little bit, but we didn't let Christ really have control of it. And so it's still hanging around. You know, the best ways to, to destroy a stronghold in your life, the best way to destroy any kind of fortification is to starve it out put it away, close the door on that, and then open the door to something better, and that's Christ. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might know what the will of God is, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. I want to invite Mel and the team to come and get ready to lead us in our song of invitation, and as they do, I want to invite you today to examine your heart, examine your life. You know Christ. You know Christ is your Lord and Savior, but for some reason, your old life is pulling at you. If it is, it's time to say no more and close the door on that old way of living. Close the door of that sinful life and open the door more to Christ and his life in you. Let God's word transform your life. Let God himself, through the Holy Spirit, work in your life and listen to him as he speaks to you. Choose today to abandon once and for all the, all the old ways and fully place your faith in Christ. Old ways have a tendency to creep back in, so shut the door to those old ways and open again the door to God and his will for your life. Romans 10, 11, I'll leave you with this, says this, all those who believe in him will not be disappointed. Amen. You won't be disappointed by trusting and the Spirit who's in you. And maybe today you say, Nathan, I don't know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I don't have the Holy Spirit in me. What do I need to do? Today, all you need to do is ask Christ to be Lord of your life. Confess your sins before him and let him in. Believe and confess that he is God and he will save you. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you, God, for your heart for us and your love for us. We thank you, Father, that you have, from the very beginning of time, established relationships with your creation. Even when they sin, Father, even when they turn their back on you, Father, you still love them. And you provided a way through your son. And Father, and through Abraham and through the blessings Father, that came through the Israelites. Father, we too, as Gentiles, get to experience the blessings that comes through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. And for the Spirit living in us, 
May we, Father, close the doors to those sins of old, to those old way of living, and may we open the door to your life in us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'll be down front if the Lord has a decision for you today. If you just want to come and pray, use the altar today, use these steps as a way of just encountering God. We have direct access to God. We don't have to go through a priest, through, through anyone else. We can go straight to him. As we sing, you respond. Still love. I hope it's now.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, today is a great day to be here in the house of the Lord, as I mentioned earlier. Not only did we get a chance to worship our Heavenly Father today, but we had a chance to be a part of a licensing service. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and ask Bill to come make his way this way. Uh, I have, uh, in just a moment, we're going to do our special call business meeting. And it won't take real long, but it just take just a few moments. So I ask for uh, your patience with us. Uh, then I'll make a few presentations with you. And we've got several other announcements. So... If we can, let's go ahead and enter into our special call business meeting, and then while we're working through the vote process, I'll make some announcements. Okay, we're going to call this business meeting to order, and I'm going to turn it over to Nation for Nate, Nation Nathan, whatever your name is. Very good. Oh, what's his name? What's my name? There you go. Well, stay here, Bill. Thank you for opening that. Did you have some help with the ballots? Do you have the people to help? Go ahead. Go ahead and pass those ballots if you've got those. Uh, so again, we're moving through the licensing service. Some of our, my guys are in the back, but I need those ballots to go ahead and start being passed out. And so if you're a church member, we ask that you take one of these ballots, and it's very simple, yes or no. Do you feel like uh, you're willing to today license Michael Phillips into a vocational call of ministry? And so uh, you had a chance to hear his testimony a few moments ago. Uh, also, thank you for leading us in worship. It was wonderful to, uh, to have you be a part of that. You've heard also some testimony from Mel, but Mel, is there anything else you want to add about Mr. Michael? Hey, um, if you would have been such a blessing to all of us, all of us on this team, um, I, I really had that kind of mentor-mentee relationship that I was telling Sam earlier that I feel like I've learned more from him <laughs> in a lot of ways, but God has really used him in my life, too, so I'm very, very thankful for you, brother, and excited for your, your future. So uh, I will, as pastor, officially recommend uh, Michael Phillips for First Baptist Church of Mineral Wells to license Michael Phillips into the ministry. And we need a second. Second. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> and something else. And second that. Let's don't hesitate. <laughs> okay. Just make sure everybody gets the ballot. And I think, make sure, don't forget the crew up here on stage. I think they would like to, to vote, and uh, some of them know some things about Michael, too, so it might be iffy. Sure. See Bill, some in Crystal and If you still need a ballot, raise your hand. We'll make sure you get a ballot. Just keep your hand raised until you get your ballot. As soon as you're completed with that, please fold that ballot and pass it to the end, and they will pick that up and do a, a quick count. Okay, I think everybody's got a ballot. Go ahead and yes or no. Okay, guys, right. go ahead and pick, pick them up, guys. All right, while they're counting those ballots, uh, let me go ahead and make a, a couple uh, of introductions. And um, we first, let me invite Samantha. We'll do Samantha, come on up. Samantha is the search committee uh, for our children's search committee. May I borrow your microphone there, Michael? And uh, I believe you guys have a recommendation that you'd like to share with the church. Yeah. Nation. Good nation. Um, we, uh, our team for the Children's Search Committee, we've been really passionate about finding a children's minister for our church. And through lots of prayer and lots of consideration, our team would like to recommend Miss Kelly Alexander as ahead, our come on next down, children's Kelly. minister. And <laughs> So she's here with us, so you can have a face to the name. So Kelly Alexander is another one of those that kind of grew up in our church. Did, did I hear right that uh, you, from cradle, basically, from the nursery, you've been here? Yeah, yeah about right. About right? Okay. And uh, grew up through our youth program, served in our youth program, and several other things along the lines, and had a heart for, for kids. 
And uh, this last, uh, how long have you been at Stephenville, First uh, Baptist about Stephenville? About a year and a half. About a year and a half as their intern, in, interim, no, intern. Intern. Intern, children's ministry intern. And uh, has a calling as well to follow the Lord's call in vocational ministry uh, in children's ministry. And we're truly excited to, to recommend you to our church. Now, uh, we've got several things that are happening. I believe we've got a couple meet and greets. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that over the next couple of weeks through our church newsletter. Please watch for that. Uh, specifically with our children's workers, we want to make sure they get the chance to visit with you and, and see you past the kid that was here to the adult that God has created you into. And uh, you've done a great job. And, and she shared with our committee some tremendous things that God's done and learned that she's learned through the process. And so I believe you as well will be uh, very surprised as well as very uh, excited to hear what God has done in her life and what God is doing continually in the area of children's ministry. So we've got some worker time to meet with you as well as church time coming up as well, heading towards May 23rd. Now that's a, a big day. That's our graduation recognition service, but that's also going to be the day that uh, we're going to present Kelly in view of a call to be our children's minister. So we're looking forward to that day. Amen. Anything else? All right. Let me, let me pray for Miss Kelly here. Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for our search committee. We thank you for the hard work of those that are involved in the search committee. And Father, we just uh, thank you for uh, bringing us to this moment today to where we can share with the church the recommendation for Kelly Alexander. We're so excited for her and for our ministry and what that means for our church. And so we just pray for over the next several weeks as the church continues to pray, as the church uh, visits with Kelly and, and begins to thinking and praying about uh, May 23rd and what you have in store. And we just love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Real quick, could you share who else is on your committee? Maybe ask them to stand or... or yes. Um, we have uh, JC's on our committee, um, Crystal Coulson, Jennifer Seaton, Mariana Wheeler, and Gen yeah, Jennifer Seaton and Karen uh, and Katie Drake. There Sorry, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Karen Owens, yeah. too. I Karen think. Owens. Yep, she's up she's there. The balcony. Yep. All right. So if you want to visit with them, be great people to talk to. So yeah. thank you so thank much, you. Samantha. Appreciate it. Okay. And uh, let me share with you these um, decisions as well. If I could, uh, Judy and Kay, would you all just mind standing and turning around? This is uh, Judith and Kay, Judith Baker, Kay Wilson. Uh, they've been here now for several months and visiting and, and being a part of Everybody wave. There you go. Uh, and they today come to join First Baptist Church uh, from a transfer of letter from First Baptist Church, Chelsea, Oklahoma. All those who welcome them, please say amen. <laughs> amen. All right, so uh, right now in COVID, we haven't been doing still the whole greet by, but a big wave, you've already done that, but please come and, and at some point and, and meet them and, and wave at them and visit with them, and we we'll look forward to that. So thank you, ladies. Y'all can have a seat. And then this is Merlin Weatherby. Did I say that right, last name? Would you mind as well standing and, and turn around? And Merlin desires to join First Baptist Church by statement. She knows Christ as her Lord and Savior and has been baptized by immersion. She as well has been here for several months, and uh, we're so glad to have her and Paul, uh, her grandson, who's over there uh, with us. And so all those that welcome her, please say amen. amen. Everybody wave at her. Wave. Say hello. Glad you're here. Okay. Bill, are y'all still counting? Nope. nope. Okay. It was a tied vote, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> we recounted. But we could not find one single no vote, so it's all yeses. Thank you so uh, much, guys. Congratulations, my friend. Uh, this is a, a certificate. And I, I had uh, David Owens, who's our clerk, sign ahead of time. I said, if the vote didn't go well, I was going to shred it. <laughs> so I don't have to shred it. But this says here, certificate of license. This is to certify Michael Phillips, who has, been given, who has given evidence that God has called him into the gospel ministry, was licensed to preach the gospel as he may have opportunity and to exercise his gifts in the work of the ministry by Mineral Wells' First Baptist Church at Mineral Wells, Texas, on the second day of May, 2021. David Owens, clerk, Nathan Buchanan, pastor. Congratulations. Thank you so much. You bet. <laughs> All yeah, right. So Just a couple, of, you didn't want to say something? I was going to say, okay. it's been so good to see all of you again, to 
see lots of familiar faces, and it's to be here to worship with you. Amen. Proud of you, Michael. All right. So uh, just the last thing, Mel, tell us about SMAC. There's a couple things. SMAC is coming soon, June 7th. If you haven't registered your kid or if you haven't volunteered, please do so. Call the church office. We've got some posters right down here on the front row, some really, really nice posters for you to take out to businesses or to to the community. So come pick one up for us. Help us get the word out uh, and place that in a a business or someplace like that where people will see, uh, lots of people will see it. So thank you. Yes, please come grab those. Love to have you take those out. See the other announcements in the bulletin. Also, these flowers here today, uh, given by Charles Cates in loving memory of Willie Casper and June Casper Cates. And so, it's been a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Let's close our business meeting, and we'll also close with a song. So, you close one, and then close two. Okay, just don't make me sing. Cause I'm, okay. I've got the mic. I Come can, on up here, I Bill. Okay. Well, I, this has been a great business meeting. I mean, I've just wonderful blessing for the church and you know it's just so important and somebody that grew up in this church how important each one of y'all are as a family and it is a family and and nobody's insignificant because just a single word or a pat on the back or means so much so thank y'all for letting God work through you we give God all the glory for any of this and just thank y'all and And let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this wonderful time that we could share. and Lord, that we can just rejoice that two of our young ones that grew up here have have come so far, Lord, and have chose to follow you, Lord, in the ministry. We'll pray for them. We'll lift them up in our thoughts. We pray you walk with them, guide them, help them through the good times and the bad times, Lord. We lift them up, and we're so thankful and so grateful that you're among us in this church, that you work through us. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing our closing song together.